Well, good evening again, folks. It's part three of our Polish Warsaw week, and we had the wonderful talks with Douglas Nash talking about the battles around the Vistula River on whichever day that was, and then Alexander Ritchie joined us to talk about the events after the, the Warsaw Uprising up until the liberation or the so-called liberation by the Russians in January 45. But tonight, we're talking about that middle bit, and joining me is Alina, who is a World War II TV regular and contributor and history hack, and all her various accomplishments are in the description below on YouTube, so you can find out what she's doing. Good evening, Alina. How are you? Hello, I'm well, thank you. How are you? I'm tickety-boo, thank you. So we're, this is the, th the period that I find of the Warsaw history that is the most neglected. People talk about the uprising, they talk about all the, that, those events there, and then sort of no one talks about it again until things start again in January 45 and, and when, when the next phase happens. But of course, um, there was lots of trage tragedy in between those events. So you're going to kind of explain and fill in the gaps of all that there. And for those who are watching, Alina lives in po uh, Poland. She's half English, half Polish, bilingual. Um, so there's no better person to talk to than Lena about this. And of course, we will mention, of course, your family involvement. Your grandfather was one of the home army. You have other family members who were in the country and various um, fates that befell them. So um, we're going to talk about that. So when, let's talk first about how the uprising came to an end. We know it began with a bang, kind of figuratively and literally, on August the 1st, and then there's you know two months or so of fighting. But then what happens, as what we discussed in the show with Alexandra how the, and, and Douglas, how, how the, the Soviets didn't make any attempt to connect and liberate the city or see the city, so the home army were kind of left on their own, and the Hitler sends in all the, the nasty SS guys, and it all gets a bit shitty there. So explain how it goes to that state, how, how the, 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 explain how the outcome um, occurs. We're coming up to 60 days now, um, and there's no food, there's no water, there's no electricity, um, there's no medicine to treat people. People are people are dying because there's there's nothing nothing available for anybody, and um, they actually they put out a call to the Soviets saying, please give us a drop, give us some ammunition, give us anything, and it's all quiet on the Western Front. Basically, they don't they don't respond, and there is only one choice, and that is to it's to give up. They they just can't do it anymore. There's there's nothing available. There's we're talking about thousands of people. I mean, hundreds and thousands of people dead now. Uh, we're talking about 150 50 thousand civilians dead. Eighteen thousand soldiers dead at this point in in sixty three days. Mm. I mean, there had been airdrops, but not enough, and often not getting to the right people, and and so on and so forth. And in fact, all we ended up doing is kind of rearming the Germans and. And, you know, when things get bleak, there's no other option. And that is unfortunate. When you look at history, you look at the Easter uprising in 1916 in Dublin, these things can often start quite well. And then when the the the, uh, the, the forces kind of surround you, it just gets harder and harder to, to decide what to do. And so who is the instigator of the decision to kind of capitulate? Is it the, the, the bottom end? Is it kind of the, the, the fighters or is it at a higher level? Well, the civilians have had enough at this point. I mean, the civilians had had enough after a couple of weeks. Um, they've just they just fed up. And actually, what we can we can see actually on the photo, um, we've got um, uh, Bor Komorowski, who's on the left hand side, the the gentleman with the armband, and on on the right hand side. Um, sorry, apologies. My dogs have decided they've just decided to play. Um, we've got von Dembach, who um, a very notorious. Um, sadistic person who uh, basically goes around and um, orders the liquidation of, of uh, the Varsovians. So we have a capitulation treaty. And um, right, I'm going to read this out for you. So the cease, there is a ceasefire on the 2nd of October, and it starts at 5am. And um, according to one of actually somebody I knew personally, she said that uh, they uh, her, um, gosh, my English language is going out the window now. Her, um, you said that was going to happen. It is going to happen, and I, I'm thinking in Polish. So, what the, the, what's the word for boss in um, uh, leader? Um, yeah, yeah. Come on, commander, leader. leader, commander. Yeah. yeah, that's the word I'm looking for. Commander. He comes in and he says, "Look, uh, there is a ceasefire. We can't fire on them. They can't fire on us. Okay, this is it. This is how it's going to go." So um, by 7 p.m. on that day, already 16,000 civilians, 16,000 Varsovians have left Warsaw. 
And the capitulation treaty reads as follows. So do bear with me on this. So on the 2nd of October 1944, the treaty to cease the hostilities in Warsaw was signed. The authorised signatory on the German side is Commander of the Warsaw Area, SS Obengruppenführer, and General Lieutenant of the Police, von der Bach. The authorised signatory is representing the Home Army Commander-in-Chief, General Kom um, Komorowski, Bur Komorowski, were one Lieutenant Kazimierz Iranek Osz Oszmiecki, uh, and two Lieutenant Kalin Zygmunt Dobrowski. So they are signing on behalf of uh, Bur Komorowski, who you saw in the photograph shaking the hand of Van de Vandenbach. So I'm only going to read a couple of these. This is really, 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 really long. Um, so I've selected a few, and uh, some of you are just going to say, really? So do bear with me. Number one, on October the 2nd, 1944, at uh, 2,100 uh, hours German time, 2,100 hours Polish time. Armed hostilities between the Polish military forces fighting in Warsaw and the German forces shall cease. All po Polish military formations fighting under the command of the Home Army Commander-in-Chief since August the 1st, 1944 until now, are to be treated as Polish military forces. These groups will be referred to below as the Home Army Forces. And we skip a couple, we get to number five. From the moment of laying down their arms, the soldiers of the Home Army are entitled to the rights of the Geneva Convention, dated the 27th of um, August, 1929. <clears throat> so, <laughs> underlying this, they really didn't care about the Geneva Convention literally days beforehand. They, they were walking in and just executing soldiers that were that were in the hospital. They was they were sick. They were dying. They, I, I just I'm so sorry that I, I, I'm finding this so humorous that now they're bringing in the Geneva Convention. They didn't care about it literally days before. So concerning the treatment of prisoners of war, soldiers of the Home Army taken prisoner in the area of the city of Warsaw in the course of the struggle, which began on August the fourth, nineteen forty four, shall enjoy the same rights. Number six, prisoners of war rights, as defined by Article 81 of the Geneva Convention. Again, Geneva Convention people. This is being underlined here. On non-discrimination based on gender are to be extended to all non-combatant support personnel of the Home Army. In particular, this pertains to women staff workers employed in communication, supply support, intelligence, press, war correspondents, etc. I'm, I'm really finding this comical because this... Uh, it does get much worse than this. So nine, civilians living in Warsaw during the uprising shall not be held collectively responsible. No person living in Warsaw during the combat shall be persecuted for any activities performed on the benefit of administrative, judicial, security, social care and charitable authorities or organisations or for participation in combat and military propaganda. No member of the aforementioned authorities and organisations shall be persecuted for their political activities prior to the uprising. Yet they get persecuted when the Soviets come in. Yeah, but as we're going to um, find out, just to interrupt you, I mean, I love we I love just how passionate you are about this subject and the, and the fact that you get you know you get very in, mostly involved in this, and we can can't blame that at all because your family involved in this, and it's you know this is close to you, this is your history. It's not it's not a subject you've plucked from some other part of the world to study. This is your own history, it's your own lineage, your own legacy, and that's why you get very very um, emotional about it, which is understandable. And it's the, the, the arrogance, I think, of the Germans sort of pretending that they're going to act completely, you know, within the rules. And uh, it's okay, you're a proper army. It's just, it's staggering they would get away with that kind of level of of um, bullshittery. It's, it's, I just, I, it really frustrates me. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to give you some examples of what was happening literally days beforehand, before all this was happening. So, um, like I said, there were mass murdering people in field hospitals. So for example, on Dolna Street, um, they just walked in and just executed everybody. And this, this is something that's repetitive. This is happening throughout the whole of the uprising. It is because, um, Himmler gives out the order to, you know, every man, woman and child that rises up is to be exterminated. Warsaw is to be raised to the ground. And we see this repeated again um, later on when we talk about the destruction of Warsaw. Um, but I've got a very specific one. I don't know if you've got the photograph up. Um, I sent you a photograph of Eva Matoszewska. Um, I don't know if she's in there somewhere. It's a, a beautiful, young, that lady there, that incredibly beautiful young lady. Okay, so Eva Matoszewska uh, on the 26th of September, 1944. She is now in a uh, field hospital in Alanya Podlegoschi, 100, um, 117, which is, if people know where Warsaw is, it's kind of in the south, in the Mokotov area. 
So she's now in a field hospital. Um, the Germans basically walk in. Um, she stayed with, uh, with, with the heavily wounded. And this is actually a repeat pretty much of um, what happened to my great grandmother. She stayed with the mortally wounded, the rest, the light wounded and now been evacuated. She stayed, Germans arrive and they murder her alongside all the other wounded men. Now, this is the worst part of the story because um, Alexandra Alexander Rich has done a, a, an excellent um, show with you guys literally a few days ago where she talks about Warsaw being, and I'm going to say this in quotation marks, liberated. Um, in January 1945, people start coming back to Warsaw and her mother goes searching for her daughter and she gets to Alenia Podlegoschi and she still finds her, she finds her daughter's body lying in exactly the same place where she died on the basement stairs and she was holding bandages in her hand and she was going to the aid of these wounded soldiers and this is one of the stories this is one of many stories that it it kind of stops you dead in your tracks and you're thinking is this even possible the brutality is is unbelievable. I mean, I but personally, my, my, my specialty is in Auschwitz, so I deal with this every day. But you still find moments where you're thinking, oh, my God, is this even, how could you do this? The, the woman is, is is going to the aid. I mean, look at her. She she was an, an accomplished nurse. She'd worked um, for, for the whole of the occupation as a nurse, and she died saving saving the lives of others, and she was murdered in cold blood. And, and this, this is, is where what we they do, 26th of September. I mean, this is days before the well, capitulation. They, 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 pretend it's they all just don't fair. care. They are murdering. Yeah. I mean, this is where we underline the, the fundamental difference between the Western Front and the Eastern Front. And I am an unashamed Western Front guy. I live in Normandy. That's where I make my money and talk about things. And there's lots of people watching this who, who, are, who, who are familiar with the battles of Arnhem and the Battle of the Bulge and Normandy and so on. And, the Eastern Front, it just gets horrible, and it gets horrible consistently. As you say, you could just read account after account after account of barbary and savagery and destruction and wanton destruction on a level that we just can't imagine. When you, you glibly kind of said 150,000 civilians, um, you know, kill, killed and wounded, it's... I mean, I'm doing a program with Mag today about a photo in Normandy where in the whole of Normandy probably 20,000 civilians were killed during the the, uh, the 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 two or three months of the Normandy campaign but you know this is this is not a drop in the ocean compared to what's happening in one city the Warsaw is a single city okay it's a, it's a big city I mean it's just it's staggering I, we cannot get our, our brains around the numbers see we say 150,000 approximately over we don't know we we just don't know the actual true scale of of these atrocities because so many so much of the evidence has been has been it's gone they were burning the bodies left right and center i mean uh, bodies were being buried in the streets we just we just don't know the it could be it could be much much higher um mm. but we we stick to about the 150 i i probably will get crucified by some people and say no i'm wrong but for the moment, the, the the statistics are stating about over 150,000 yep. civilians. So before we go back into some of the, the graphic stories and the and the incredible stories you've uncovered, let's go back to the the, the capitulation, the surrender, and and deal with the the the, the events that occurred around that. E even though it, it's you know the Germans were being ridiculous with their pretent pretense to uh, acknowledge the Geneva Convention, but there was there was an official capitulation. So I'll put the photos up. So explain what was happening. So I've, I've written a thing on my notes here. How did the soldiers view the capitulation? Now, this is a very, re it's a recurring theme, pretty much what I'm going to say now. Um, everybody was uh, distraught, horrified. Um, it was, it was painful. They've just been fighting for the freedom of their, of their city, of their country. And they're about to give up. Um, they have to give up. There is, there is no option. There is no option out. I mean, this was, this was supposed to last three, four days, a week, a week at max. This is, this is, it's mind blowing that they've managed to survive for so long. So, for example, um, Anna Halina Kowalska, she said, "We, when we found out, we cried for the insurgents, but the civilians, the civilians were happy. It's finally over. Um, people were afraid of being shot, executed. There was so much fear in this city." 
Janusz Kowalski, he was only 15 years old, he said, it, it brought relief, but we were incredibly bitter. Um, mm. The doctor, Dr. Ludwig, he turns around, he said, the worst moment of the uprising for me was being told about the capitulation. It was mentally defeating. It's a, a feeling of hopelessness of going into German captivity, but he's now no longer afraid of being shot. Mm. And this is so, you, you just hear this, it's an over and over and over. And I, I bet I've gone through so many different testimonies and I've tried to pick out the most um, interesting ones. And it is just incredible. The feel, mm. I mean, I would, wouldn't you? Well, yeah, I mean, it's hard, to, it's hard to get ourselves into that situation, isn't it? I mean, I, I can't, I've read a bit about this and over two months of fighting, 60 days, where you would get to the point where you kind of have accepted you're probably going to die, you, you, you've seen so many people die around you, to maybe they don't think there's an, an outcome other than death, and then suddenly someone is saying, well, we're going to capitulate now. Perhaps they'd already kind of, I suppose, made peace with their gods, if you like. They'd already accepted that fate, and... And now they're saying, well, you're not going to see this through. You're not going to join your dead comrades. You're now going to walk away from this, theoretically, to, uh, to, uh, to, to safety. Safety, quote, unquote, you know, and, a, and a, a better situation. That's the thing is, as we'll find out, as you'll explain, that the, the situation they found themselves in was, was, was not better, different, uh, but, but not better. So, you know, keep, keep on with the story about how this capitulation, and, you know, you say you've been through these accounts. There is a different... That not everybody thinks the same. Some people wanted to carry on. You said the civilians, they were happy it was all over. So it's not like the city is at this point united in the same way perhaps they were 60 days earlier. Was that a fair comment? So when the when uprising started, people were like, yes, this is, this is, this is amazing. We're going to fight for our freedom. It's, it's going to be a few, like I said, it's going to be a few days. And then as you read on, the civilians, the attitude, I mean, don't get me wrong, the city was united. They were still helping. They were um, bringing food, helping, uh, cleaning things, you know, various different things were still happening at the same time, but there was still resentment. There was still resentment to the insurgents at the end of the day. And the civilians were just happy because everyone, everyone knew what was going on in Vola. Everyone knew what was happening on the Hota. Everyone knew that the Germans were walking into field hospitals. They were walking into into um, into a big so big hospitals. So, for example, the Radom Institute. Um, it, I've actually spoken to, about this on a different podcast. I'm not going to go through this. The, the whole what happened. It, it's a uh, uh, it happened with the Rona. Uh, if anybody's interested, Google Rona, um, uh, Kaminsky's brigade. They basically came in and they terrorised a, a whole hospital. Um, but this is what was happening to, to these to these places. It was. Um, I still can't wrap my hand around it. However many times I read and go through this, but let's go back to to to, to where we are. So the fifth. We're back to the fifth of October. Fifth of October is is basically D Day. Um, for those of you, uh, that is it. Um, so capitulation, how did it look like? Well, um, Anna Halina Kowalska, she said, there's there's going to be a capitulation, we know. The one thing that hurt the most, that hurt her the most and her sister, and they remember it incredibly clearly, was when they're leaving Warsaw, the Germans started to burn the houses that were left. And um, when she returned home back in January 1945, they were all destroyed, everything was gone. And that's the one thing she underlines is that watching Warsaw basically burn for her was the worst. Um, you've got soldiers. So, for example, this actually comes out. So very different, very different aspects. So soldiers, I'll give you the, the general idea. Soldiers were basically told they have to give up their weapons. OK, so each area kind of went through this slightly differently. Um, so there was one in front of the Polytechnic of Warsaw, which is uh, south of the, the old town. Um, he says... Uh, Tadeusz Borenski, he says, I had a handgun. So you throw them into baskets and ammunition for baskets, baskets like potatoes. And the Germans took pictures of us. There were heavy weapons, machine guns, rifles, um, and they, there was just so many of them. So that's the first example of how uh, Tadeusz experienced that. Then we have another one uh, with Václav Zagorski. He experienced his capitulation slightly differently. Um, so all the time we were marching along total ruins and burnt out buildings in which there was no sign of life, not even a blade of grass. 
Just before the square, we caught up with the unit that had marched out an hour before us, and there was a hold up. They were handing over their arms. We formed a single file. There were tables that had been placed in the center of the square, and as we passed, we had to hand over our arms to the German soldiers. I handed over two revolvers and went on, still wearing my saber. So they weren't, I'd like to say they were all giving up their weapons. They weren't, just so you know. Um, some of them were taking them apart, hiding them in the ruins. This was going to be used for any future actions, anything else that would ever be needed. They knew the Soviets were coming and the news that was coming from the East was horrific to what the Soviets were doing to the home army members. So they were also partially preparing themselves for what was to come. Mm. And I do have a quote from Władysław Spielmann. I don't know if you want me to read that one, because that's actually yes, probably, uh, it's a really interesting one, because um, if anybody's interested, do go and get yourselves, um, you've all watched The Pianist, uh, excellent film, even though obviously there's controversy surrounding uh, the, the um, what's his name? Director, Plansky, yeah. That's the one. Thank you. But the film is excellent and it does actually show um, a fantastic way of what Warsaw looked like at the time. But this is what Władysław Spielmann says. So bear with me, I'm just going to read this. Not until the 5th of October, so this is where we are at the moment, the 5th of October, did detachments of the rebels begin marching out of the city, surrounded by Wehrmacht men. Some were in uniform. Some had only red and white armbands on their sleeves. They formed a curious contrast with the German detachments escorting them, who were, in, impec who were in impeccable uniform, well fed and self confident, mocking and jeering at the failure of the rebellion as they filmed and photographed their new prisoners. So, this is where I want to underline this. This has now been mentioned twice. They're now photographing, as you can see, um, some of these were being taken by um, insurgent cameramen, and there are other ones that are being taken by the. It's all, it's all for propaganda. Have a look at the silly polls. They've now capitulated. We are the brave Germans. We have won. Mm. So he continues, the rebels on the other hand, so you've got the Germans here. They're beautifully dressed, clean, and on the flip side, the rebels. On the other hand, were thin, dirty, often ragged, and couldn't keep on their feet, only with difficulty. They paid no attention to the Germans, ignoring them entirely as if they had chosen to march along the Alenia Podlogoschi of their own free will. They had kept discipline in their own ranks, supporting those who had difficulty in walking, and they didn't so much as glance at the ruins, but marched on looking straight ahead. I mean, for me, that's, that's incredibly poetic. I mean, they're defeated and they're still marching with their heads held high, no matter what. Yeah. Oh, there you go. There is primary. There is a photograph exactly right there. Burkomorovsky, right in the middle, and the men are marching, their heads held high, and women, of course, because there's women uh, who were also uh, taken as prisoners of war. I myself, uh, my gra my grandmother described what my grandfather would say. This is I can't really use this as a historical evidence. I'm going to still throw it in because it's a personal story. Um, she told me that my grandfather would tell her about the capitulation, and. The soldiers were basically all you could hear were the feet of the soldiers marching through and then the clang of the weapons as they're being thrown down. Mm. Yeah. Staggering stuff. And we're going to have to get to the subject sooner or later, Alina, of the various fates of all these people, because it's not like there's one thing that happened to everybody, isn't it? There's there's different lots of things. So so let's let's talk about the, the yep. where the city is at this point in the terms of there's lots and lots of dead who presumably have not been buried yet. There's lots and lots of um, homeless people. There's now the captured home army. There's the desperate people in the city who are helping or not helping the home army. And there's the Germans who at some point are going to leave and then Hitler's going to... Uh, so what are the various... These groups, let's run through what happened to the various. Which one, which group do you want to go through with first? The, the, the home, army fi start, home army fighters? And let's start with the Dulag, one to one, Proshkov. Let's start with that one. Um, only because, just so I can set the scene just a little bit. So, this is, um, it, some people refer to it as a concentration camp, it's not. Um, it is basically a transit camp where people are waiting. I mean, the conditions there are actually really horrific. It's basically um, a railway plant. 
Um, it's a workshop that's crowded. Um, there's lots of iron, there's wood, there's dirty linen covered with oil and and it's cold and it's a, it's a re it's a, just a horrible place to be. You can see see in the background just there on the photograph. They actually created this on the 6th of August, so literally six days after the uprising starts. And in the whole total between August and October 1944, so let's say 60 nearly 70 days because there's still people being deported um, after the 5th. 550,000 Varsovians are being expelled out. And that's through the whole of those rough 60, 70 days. And that's also not including 100,000. So we're looking at 650,000 people are now being expelled and the 100,000 from the immediate vicinity. <clears throat> So, Prushkov, there's also another where the soldiers go for bullets. Well, let's stick with Prushkov for the moment. I'm going to start with Auschwitz, only because it kind of interweaves into our story, um, because we start with Auschwitz at the beginning, and these, this is the result of the Warsaw Uprising, and I still classify what's happening to these people as this. So, um, 100, so, uh, 600, 60, 100, sorry, start again, my statistics are out of the window, 60,000 people are sent to concentration camps. They are sent to the following camps. Auschwitz, Buchenwald, Dachau, Flossenburg, Grossrosen, Mattenhausen, Ravensbrück, Sachsenhausen, and Stutthof. But I'm going to stick to Auschwitz because that's the slightly easier option. <clears throat> there are just under 13,000 men, women, and children that are deported to Auschwitz. And the deportations start on the 10th of August, so 10 days after the uprising starts. There's two transports that arrive on the 11th of August, and that's nearly six thousand people arrive these are innocent people they're not so in Auschwitz at the moment we're talking about August 1944 we have um what's happening with the direct extermination we have political prisoners we have criminals we have um homosexuals we have um asocials we have I'm doing this list off the top of my head. Uh, Soviet mm. prisoners, well, actually not very many Soviet prisoners, well, literally a dozen. These are not, these are these are average normal people that have not been part participating in the up um, in 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 the um uh in the underground resistance. They've not been caught in roundups. This is a whole different category of prisoners. And it's filled with women and, and pregnant women. I need to underline that pregnant women are also involved and also being sent to this place. So what happens to them at, uh, at, at Prushkov? They're loaded into freight cars, like you see where they started loading um, Jews in Hungary. They started loading them into freight cars. They, they weren't given the opportunity to get on, on a train, on a third-class passenger train. And there's so many women and children. They're locked in. They arrive in Auschwitz. The men are separated from the women, obviously, and they're locked in two empty barracks till the early morning without food, without water. And then registration, we're talking about 6,000 people on their first transport. Registration is now taking days. You're having to register 6,000. That's a lot of people you're having to register. Just to let you know, these people weren't tattooed. They were given a piece of cloth with a red triangle, a P in the middle, which stands for um, political prisoner and pole. But they weren't tattooed. Um, the really interesting thing is, is um, this is a lot about children happening um, with the story. So there, there's, there's a lot, a lot of men, women and children. Um, children are moved into uh, barrack number 16 in the women's camp. Pregnant women are moved to barrack 13. But this is this is where it just starts to really just get worse. Um, 100 boys aged between nine and 10 and above and now being moved to the men's quarantine camp in B2A. They're no longer classified as children. Nine-year-old boys are now longer not being classified as children. They're being classified as men. Um, I do have a couple of stories and a couple of quotes. So if you do bear with me, I'm covered with books at the moment. Um, so 12-year-old uh, Le Hoswaf Swobinski, uh, he was inmate number 191585. Um, on the 10th of August, SS run into the courtyard screaming and shouting, ordering everyone to go out on the street. An elderly woman cannot stand this tragic situation, and in a nervous breakdown, she jumps out of a window from the fourth floor to the blind courtyard. There is an injured insurgent, insurgent among us. The Germans cannot notice him because otherwise death awaits him. In the street, men get separated from women and children. I exchanged the last looks with my father. 
we enter the grounds belonging to the church of Volska Street. On the right, by the entrance at the graveyard, next to the cross, there is an SS officer sitting at a table, a woman kneeling in front of him, begging for something. Before my eyes, the SS man unfastens the holster and fires at the woman. In less than one hour, the Germans drive us together with a large group of people in the direction of Zahodnya railway station. I'm not going to continue because this is quite a long one. But you have the idea of what these civilians are going through. And then they end up in hell, as I describe Auschwitz. Um, there's there's whole whole fam whole families are ending up. So, for example, Irena um, Stanka, she's born in 1932. Uh, my mathematics isn't really great, so she would have been um, 15, 16, I think, at the time. Uh, she's deported to Auschwitz in August with her pregnant mother, her father, yeah. her sister Yadviga, who was born in 1942, her brother, who's born in 1928, and another brother who's born in 1930. So the brothers, along with their father, they're very quickly transferred to another camp after a few days in Auschwitz. They're um, transferred to Natzweiler. And then in January 1945, I mean, her mother ends up giving birth in Auschwitz. And if anybody's interested, there's some really great information about what happens to pregnant women in Auschwitz. It's some of the most horrific things you'll actually ever read. Um, and her and her mother and her sister are evacuated to one of the camps in Sachsenhausen, um, where her mother actually gives birth in Sachsenhausen. But the brothers come back, but the father doesn't. So we're looking at whole families are being deported from the Warsaw Uprising, innocent civilians. Mm. Um, can, I, can I just clarify something with you, Alina? So you, yeah. you talked about the terms of the capitulation, where the Germans said they were going to treat all these people as you know, prisoners of war, blah, blah, blah. So already before they'd even published that document, in August, they are already taking people away from the city of Warsaw who were simply in the members of the Home Army. So they were fighting, they were soldiers, and they're already treating them as political prisoners and sending for Auschwitz. Yes, that's that's what I'm understanding? No, they're civilians. There's, well, they're civilians from... They're sending they're, innocent civilians out to Auschwitz. And is, does this include people of the Home Army as well? Or how do yes. they classify civilian and Home Army? That's what I'm trying to kind of get to my There are groups of women that end up being transferred to concentration camps that are nurses and liaison officers. Um, and I can't remember exactly the date for when this happened. There's a large group of them sent to Auschwitz at the time. And it's it's this is chaos. There is no There are no rules to this at mm. all. I mean, I still to this day, I, I can't comprehend and understand why someone does this and, and someone does something else. It, it, this, this, these 63 days make no sense. Yeah. But the bottom but line for this is Warsaw needs to be exterminated. Yeah. I'm just trying to get my head around the fact that there's within the middle of Warsaw, there are home army people with almost complete uniforms they've got armbands and helmets and you've got other people who are just wearing civilian clothes who may have a pistol and maybe not even an armband and you've got civilians as well how do the germans differentiate between who is who or do they just not give a shit so the prisoners at this point we're talking about the end on the yeah. fifth the insurgents are being allowed to wear their armbands Right. That is how they're differentiating the difference. Um, there's So, for example, I use her in, in everything, and I really hope that uh, her granddaughter's listening. It's Halina Pashkovska. I bring her up in everything I do, and I have to, because this woman, her life is just absolutely incredible. Um, Halina Pashkovska is a really good example of actually, she fought as a, as a liaison officer, but she actually ended up um, joining the civilians. And she says she joined the civilians because her sister, her sister decided not to fight in the uprising local to each other but she said if there's any chance for me to be joined with my sister now it's going to be now so she basically resigned from being a um a home army member and she said that's it. i'm going to go join my sister and they again this causes chaos they get on a train they um end up near prushkov and funnily enough this 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 incredible woman has a thing for jumping off of trains um and right. I've, I, I'll, I'll try and find and put in the link a couple of things that I've spoken about in the past about her. But they jump off the train, they don't get to Prushkov, and they manage to uh, just not get deported for, for slave labor because that's where they're going to be heading. So what she actually ends up doing, she remembers a conversation that she had with a friend of hers during the Warsaw Uprising. And he said, look, if you get stuck, something happens, 
this is where my parents live, um, which funnily enough, I looked on a map recently and it's it's not far from where I live at the moment. Um, but this is where you need to go. We have a villa. My family will take care of you. So she ends up taking, uh, taking. I think she takes a train and she ends up going there, which is not far from where I live now in, in Bielsko-Biała. And she ends up getting a job working for a, doc a doctor to get some money. And she lives with this family and they take her in. And this is what else is happening. Poles are not just being deported for slave labor. They are not just being deported to uh, prisoner of war camps or concentration camps. They're homeless. They've basically been taken, uh, I think it's uh, 30,000 uh, insurgents were taken to Krakow. Here you go. There's 30,000 refugees. Sort them out. Mm. I just, they have no clothes. They have no food. They have no money. They have nothing. They have zero. They have nothing. Here you go. Live. Yeah. No, I mean, this is... I've done lots of hundred and something and, of these shows, and th this is about the most um, well. I've been lost for words about just the, the what happens to these people, and you know. So, so let's um, to try and kind of get things on course, so I can understand where we're going on. So after the capitulation of October, so the 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 insurgents, the Home Army, are allowed to march out with their armbands. Now, of those survivors, mm -hmm. differing things happen to them. From from the what's the worst thing that could happen to you if you were an insurgent? And what is the best thing that could happen to you? Because obviously there's different things that happen. What just kind of the best example? What's the what's the what 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 would be your fate? Um, actually, probably one of the best things happened. Uh, I'm with my granddad. Actually, what happened to him? Um, he ended up in Fallingbostel. Uh, I think you've got a map of where all the um, all the camps were. So Fallingbostel, Fallingbostel was uh, not far from Bergen Belsen. Uh, she's be able to see Bergen Belsen on the on the on the map there, and he probably. <sighs> I don't want to say life was perfect in a prisoner of war camp. It wasn't. Um, but that was probably the best deal that you got. He stayed in Fanning Bostel from the, the day he, that he arrived to the day that he was liberated by the British. And all the Americans, gosh, I can never remember anymore. Belson was, was the British. I think it was the Brit yeah, Belson yeah, was British. The, 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 the British. And he didn't have to do anything, really. It just the living conditions were weren't very good um the worst actually ended up happening to some of the younger um younger prisoner of prisoners of war and uh they ended up being sent from prisoner of war camp to prisoner of war camp and they were under the geneva convention you're not prisoners of war are not supposed to work and they ended up working uh, they would break up roads. They would do some hard breaking labor. So these are the, these are young kids. We're talking about 13, 14, 15 year old kids um, that have been taken or, or the youth, as they were called. And uh, they were they were forced into doing all various. That's probably out of the prisoners of war. That would have been the worst. Or unless if you want to count that, if you were injured and um, there was no medical treatment, that could also be an option um, of a getting a short straw but there was a hospital um at one of the camps and they did they did help quite a lot of prisoners out mm. so i've so, got um i do have a um a quote of what fighting bustle actually did look like by um janusz Głowacki. um I yeah, can read just, out. just before you do that just for those watching there's gonna be a lot of people british army ex people whose fathers fighting boss of course was a big british army um base all through the 60s 70s 80s so no, numerous people who are kind of uh, people like Duncan who does filming for me will remember Fanning Bolstel because of it. it's it's post-war cold war British army base but we're talking about in 44 45 when it was a very very different kind of place than the than the jovality of British army service in the 70s so yeah get read us the account okay so Janusz Grofatsky says it was a large camp uh, divided into sectors, and there were already a lot of prisoners. Um, there were already English, American, French. Some were still sitting remnants of Poles from 1939. So remember, in 1939, when Germany invaded Poland, they still took prisoners of war, and there were some of these men were in there for nearly, nearly five years. Um, we were not there for long, probably several days, only that they registered us. I do not remember how many days we were in Falling Bostel, because later about 600 people were loaded into a train and taken to Dorsten. It was a camp in Westphalia. Soon we found out why they transported us. 
and here is a prime reason, from the so-called Albitz Commando, i.e. the Labour Commando. I found myself in Krefeld, a city on the west side of the Rhine, near Dusseldorf, not far from Essen, to work. Um, I think for women, it probably was one of the most traumatic things because there was quite a few women. You've got, um, there's a photograph actually up um, and that is, um, and I can never remember her first name, but um, her surname is Hruschel. So she's Antoni Hruschel's um, daughter, uh, daughter. Uh, not the one who's still alive in Warsaw, for those who are thinking, that's actually her sister who died a few years ago. And they're women at Fallingbostel and they were all photographs. I've, I've actually got a photograph of my grandfather like that. I don't know why I didn't send that to you. Uh, so we could have uh, we could have put that up because you could see his, uh, his camp number. Next time, next time we'll, we'll stick it we'll up. We'll do a special on my grandfather, um, that'd be cool. Oh, do you know what? I'd love to do one on my grandfather. He did some yeah, incredible it, things. Um, we'll do that. For me, it's a Hollywood show, what he did. It's it's unbelievable, some of the things. Um, but yeah, he ended up in Valley Bostel with, uh, with these... Um, um, so here, the women actually quote that the latrines filled them with terror. Um, they were single longs filled, fixed above enormous pits full of excrement. And you had to squat, squat on them to do your business. And there was no room for privacy. Um, mm. I can tell you right now, that's something I wouldn't, I don't think anybody would really enjoy, would they? No. So basically, no. Um, these guys are now being sent out to, I mean, there were so many. Um, they were sent to, here, I've actually got a list for you. Uh, Stalag uh, 344 Lambsdorff. Uh, Stalag 10B Sandbostel, which is not to be mixed up with Fallingbostel. Uh, Stalag 11A, and I can't pronounce this name, Alten, Alten Grabov. Um, Stalag 11C Fallingbostel. Stalag 11C Bad Schulze. Stalag, I can't even count Roman numerals, 5, 6, 7, 7. Stalag 7, C Sagan. Stalag 11D Nunberg. And Stalag 4B um, I'm butchering German here. I really do apologize for anybody that's listening. Uh, Mullenberg. Mullenberg sounds think, right to me. Yeah. Is how you pronounce it. But they were, they were being sent all across. Some of them were for, for officers. Obviously my grandfather was an officer, so he ended up in Fallingbostel. But actually most of, uh, most of his, um, unit were actually ended up with him in Fallingbostel. Oh, and there we go. We've got a photograph of, of Fallingbostel. Yeah. So, um, so the what... separation of men and women. So what numbers are we talking about that were left in it? You know, because I'm conscious of the fact um, we keep on talking about this for, God, for we hours still now. still have a little bit of time to go. I'm, I'm worried about the time here. Yeah, I do no, apologise people have gone around me talking. We've got some um, time. So <laughs> where, where, how many people were – let's let's go through the figures. What was the population of Warsaw probably before the war, roughly? Oh, Hello? if you repeat that, only because my internet has decided to kill itself. Okay, yeah, I've noticed the connection's been going a bit odd. What was the population of Warsaw before the war, roughly? Right, so before pre-war, we've got 1.3 million. Right. And uh, just before the Warsaw Uprising, uh, we've got 920,000 people that are living in Warsaw. Uh, you've got to remember uh, 300,000 of those were Jews. Yeah. that were imprisoned in the Warsaw Ghetto or Warsaw yeah. Ghetto yeah. at the time. Uh, and I also need to underline this, actually. So there killed... were... Sorry. So 150,000 yeah, no, 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 it's fine. Killed, uh, so, yeah. killed during the uprising. And then how many of the remainder were taken away in various... So there was there's prisoners of war, there's work camps, there's... Deep... So how many were taken, or how, rather how many were left in the city of Warsaw by the time we get to the winter? So you've got 18,000 taken to prison of war camps, uh, 90,000 90, are taken to forced labour, and 60,000 are taken to concentration camps. And then the rest are kind of dispersed and taken to Transdohova, to Krakow, and to various other different places and just kind of left to their own devices, really. So, so left in the city itself, really not very many. A few thousand. Is your internet packet clear? About a few thousand left in the city, is that right? Has my internet decided to die? 
Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's back again now. So a few, just a few thousand left in the city. No, well, haha. We say no, but there was uh, Vladislav Spielmann. There you go, an exact example. Uh, I've got a little bit more from him, actually. Um, he he writes here. I was the only living soul here now. The first day of November was approaching and it was beginning at night. To keep myself going mad in my isolation, I decided to lead a disciplined life as possible. So he he wasn't actually on his own, but he believed he was. The, the, the streets of Warsaw were empty. At the same time, things are happening, like they're looting, which we'll touch on in a minute, a bit, a bit about looting and uh, destroying the city as a whole. But there are a lot of people, predominantly Jews, and we don't, we don't know how many people were left, predominantly Jews, and they're hiding in the ruins. They've managed to make themselves sort of like basement caves that were covered with rubble and covered with dead bodies and all sorts the reason behind this is there were so many of them already being persecuted, they were worried that they would be found out that they were Jews and executed or taken to a concentration camp and killed. It was it, it was not something that you wanted to be caught. So, for example, Chaim Goldstein, um, he was originally taken to Auschwitz and then they brought him out of Auschwitz to work in the ghetto after the ghetto uprising. And he ended up in a, sort of a makeshift concentration camp in Warsaw in the ghetto, which was liberated uh, during the Warsaw Uprising. So he joined the fight in the Warsaw Uprising, but he didn't want to leave the city because he was scared. He was scared that he would get persecuted. So he hid and he waited till the Soviets arrived. And a lot, you would find a lot of these people, but they were, they were just hidden. You wouldn't see them. And they lived literally in the ruins for a couple of months. Yeah. And I'm, so, um, talking. I'm, I'm playing the footage. This is, folks, this is German footage of the bombing of Warsaw. Because, alas, the city has not, um, it's not all over yet. Because let's talk about the actual, the physical, we've talked about the, the people in the city and the deportations and the prison of war camps and the concentration camps. But what? happened physically to the city of Warsaw that was already nearly destroyed just in the fighting in August and September. But then there's the next chapter. So while the footage is playing, explain that to us, please. So I did tell you what Himmler stated and the Hitler's order on the 1st of August 1944 is to raise Warsaw to the ground completely, destroyed women, children, anybody who rises up against us, they are to be completely exterminated. The second time this comes around is on the 9th of October, so uh, literally a few days after people are being evacuated out of the city and being deported to concentration camps, labor camps, um, and to various other refugee places. And he says exactly the same thing. Warsaw, Warsaw basically needs to learn a lesson. How dare you rise up against us, the Germans? We are going to we are going to wipe Warsaw off the map. It is not going to exist anymore. This is when the looting and the destruction of the city begins. So by the 15th of October, 23,300 train cars. Okay, I'm going to repeat that. 23,300. 300 train cars are loaded with booty. Yeah. Okay. Can you imagine how many priceless pieces of artwork, museum artifacts, books, uh, documents, uh, gold, I don't know, anything you could find of value? That also, there were also 1,600 wagons of grain, and they all went to the Third Reich. So between the 17th of October and the 13th of November, there becomes a new operation. So not only have they looted the booty, they have looted everything out of Warsaw. They are now looting things. They send in people to start collecting things and they basically gather about 100, 190 tons of goods. Warsaw has been completely and utterly picked clean now. There is, there is nothing. It is just a city of ruins. And then this is when the operation starts to basically burn and destroy everything. And it was, this is, this is again, we come back to the surrender agreement, okay? They say in the surrender agreement that Poles can keep their cultural heritage. 
Yeah. Oh, have we, have we lost so, the Oh, there we are. Oh, have I cut out? Am I still yeah, there? Yeah, just a couple of seconds. Just adds a bit of excitement to the live stream, Alina. We needed a bit more excitement. I can, uh, we, I've got a lovely list here of uh, things that were destroyed. Uh, if you'd like me to go through with that. Yeah, please. Right, so... Poland's oldest library was in Warsaw. It was uh, built in 17, uh, 1747. And it held thousands of priceless documents and books. And they burnt it to the ground. 400,000 printed items were destroyed. That's it. Poland's cultural heritage, gone. Mm. They also burnt the National Archives. Only 4% of archives survive, 4%. I mean, for historians, my heart is already breaking. I'm already going great, 4% survived. Mm. They, are, they are liquidating, national. the National Museum goes. The Saski Palace is gone. And for those who have been to Warsaw, um, there is that is where the uh, Grave of the Unknown Soldier is now and um from what i've heard the government is planning to rebuild the palace and possibly so they're destroying palaces they're destroying museums they ended up destroying hospitals schools churches statues apartment blocks i mean everything they are burning everything out so out of twenty four thousand seven hundred twenty four buildings so again twenty four thousand seven hundred twenty four buildings ten thousand four hundred and fifty five are reduced to rubble mm. We're talking yeah. about just under half. Yeah. So there were 923 historic buildings gone. 923 historic buildings gone. Uh, 25 churches and synagogues also gone. Completely burnt out. 81 primary schools. 64 high schools. Also, the University of Warsaw and the University and the Warsaw University of Technology also gone. Monuments, statues, have we lost Alina? Are you still there? Oh. Well, it seems like we might have temporarily lost Lena. I hope she'll come back in. But while that, while Lena's struggling to get back in, this say uh, this footage shows you just how much destruction has been done to the city of Warsaw. And you know, we, we what I will add to this, and hopefully Lena will come back in a second, is that when we learn on the shows with Alexandra and with Douglas Nash, is that we, Hitler's ridiculous obsession with destroying Warsaw is actually not even what he should be doing tactically in the by destroying the city, Hitler is putting resources into something that is actually a waste of time. He'd be better off trying to defend his homeland by now. He'd be better off putting his forces somewhere else. But his anger, that's the thing when you're dealing with mad people. With people like Hitler and Stalin, they don't operate on the levels that we do, making decisions based on, on, on practicalities. They make it entirely on emotion and their madness. And so all this effort spent to destroy Warsaw's heritage is actually not only damaging Warsaw's heritage, he's damaging his own Third Reich war effort irrevocably by doing this. So it's just ridiculous all around. I, it just makes no sense. Okay, so the city's risen up. Okay, I'm just going to take a load of soldiers and put the resources to destroy this whole city. I mean, why? Why are you doing that? It, it mm. just makes no sense. He was just so angry over Warsaw, basically. Defi I mean, the Lvov uprising, I mean, they quashed it in a couple of days. And he's angry because these guys managed to last 63 days. How dare you? How dare you rise up against the Third Reich? How dare you? Just while, while you were... This, we got a great question from Rich Owen. We're going back to looting and these 2,300 rail cars taken away. In the years since the war, has any of this treasure been recovered? Has anything come back to Poland or is it all just gone forever? Not all of it's not gone. Some of it's come back. Um, there are 
um, debates going on right now. I'm just going to leave it at that. There are debates going on. Uh, there is a book being written by Mag. Dalena Ogurek is actually come out in English. As someone actually, I'm, I'm going to try and get her onto History Hack and talk about her book. And she talks about uh, some of the Polish artwork being stolen and looted. Um, it's just, it is a recurring theme when it comes down to looting Polish, Jewish um, artwork, even, even parts of the Soviet Union. The Germans just looted everything. Yeah. I mean, we could we could do a show about the the, the stuff in the Swiss banks. I mean, another show in its in its own entirety about all the stuff that's still there and the money and the, you know. But you you the fact is, you just mentioned that last sentence there that the Soviets. I think we need to address that next chapter of 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 the Warsaw story. So the so the population has been either killed, deported, taken away to work camps, to uh, to death camps, to prison of war camps, the whole lot. Others have died. There's now the malnutrition. There's the there's the displaced personnel who've just tried to get out somewhere else. And now the city is nearly in ruins and its treasures and culture has all been taken away as well. And then the next stage is, as we did with Alex uh, uh, two nights ago, is the Russians' attack in the Oda Vista uh, 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 advance of January 45. And the city is, as you said, they're liberated. So you must have some testimonies of people who were who are who, who witness that what what how did that then affect the, on an individual level what how, are people i mean they're just emotionally they must be at the end of their absolute tether by then i mean that how, i can't imagine how many months of shitty suffering they've been enduring and now the soviets march in and they do almost almost a, a reverse thing they organize their parades and their banners and their flags and it's the same thing it's marching through the streets so what happened there with the, liber with the liberation as we call it I um I don't know if you've seen the liberation. Uh, I don't know if you showed that the liberation um, video that they have of liberating Warsaw. We just did a couple of pictures. That's all. Ah, oh, there is there is a video of them liberating. Li sorry, sorry, rephrase that. Liberating mm. Warsaw. Um, it's so filled with propaganda. Um, for example, Halina Pashkovska, She wants to come home. And she just she 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 does. She just goes home after the 17th, after Warsaw is again liberated. Um, and they just try and get on with their lives. These people, some people are not allowed to come home though. You gotta remember those in prisoner of war camps by January the 17th, they're still sitting in prisoner of war camps up until April and May. They're not getting liberated. Some of them are ending up in concentration camps. Some of these people are not being liberated, well, yeah, till May 1945. You know, they don't have the chance to be able to come back. Um, and mm. a lot of people didn't, uh, including my own family. They didn't come back because they feared what the Soviets would do. And the Soviets at this point, uh, between August 1945 and, sorry, 1944 and 19, um, August 1945, they arrested 100,000 people and most of them were home army members. Yeah. They've been put into into makeshift camps and the whole wave of terror starts all over again. I mean, who wants to return to that? Who wants to admit that they're a home army member? Yeah, and and, and yeah, I mean, it's just the, the, the catalog from... of mis misadventures that this poor city endured is just is just staggering. And 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 so when we, we we talked about this on the previous shows, we talked about Alexander talked about Warsaw in the big the big political spectrum and how it sits with the Soviets and the Germans and then and maybe the people of the city perhaps would have been better not rising up in August maybe but that's that's all the big picture it's a small picture it's that what happened to the people caught up the individuals so and today is an anniversary for you because this is the anniversary of, of, one of your great uncle's fate isn't it so do you, do you want to share what that that story as well with us today um so I, one of the reasons I started working on what I did, um, so which is the first transports, the early days of Auschwitz, not only because it's such an unknown part of history, but because my uh, great uncle 
actually uh, died in Auschwitz. Today is the, if my maths is correct, because I'm never good with mathematics, it's the 78th anniversary of his death in Auschwitz. To this day, we don't know how he died. We know that he died in block 20, so he would have been uh, sick, most likely with typhus. He was there for at least two to three months because he was receiving, he was sending letters to his wife. And um, I think that's that's the best that's the best explanation we've got for why he passed away. And because um, yet at this point they weren't um, doing selections and gassing people out of out of the hospital. And um, I went today to Auschwitz to lay some flowers in his memory because I do that every day, uh, every day, every year uh, on this anniversary. And um, I send the photographs to my family just to remind them of the day as well. Mm. Well, you know, on behalf of the World War II TV family, we extend to you our, our gratitude for your, your family. And, and we can only imagine that the horrors that went through people who lived through the, the fighting in Eastern Europe and the struggles there. And, you know, my family, uh, I had you know family on uh, uncle on Sword Beach and uncle as a, as a, co a cousin, as a, as a part of Lancaster, but nothing compared to the, 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 the endurance these people had to go through. So. So what was life like when, when people start drifting back to Warsaw? And we're not going to do the whole Cold War here, but for the next year or two, you know, at, at what point did the city get back to any semblance of kind of civilization in terms of the water on again and power and work? And, you know, and, and, I, know, and I appreciate we're talking about within the, within the Soviet regime, but how long did it take to get to any kind of semblance of normality? God, years, years. I mean, even today, Warsaw is still building and Warsaw is still taking down, very, and this is something that really annoys me. So if anybody is listening from the Warsaw government right now, I'm telling you, it's really, really horrible that you're taking, because there are still original buildings that are standing. There are still uh, buildings from the ghetto that that survived. I mean, the, the outside of them survived, so they managed to rebuild the insides. And they're tearing them down. They're tearing them down for new, better accommodation. They're tearing down our history um, of things that survived. I mean, my God, this these buildings survived the uprising and they survived the destruction. So it's just, it's an absolute, abs oh, it's, yeah, it's terrible. But it took a long time for Warsaw to get back up and running. Um, oh, did I just see that? Warsaw was pretty much devastated. Yes, yes, there are still bullet, bullet holes. For, so, for example, um, when we did the one with Alexandra Ricci in uh, August, I went and showed uh, a load of bullet holes down in Povishla um, on Smolikovskiego and down by the river. There's another set of bullet holes. So there are still remnants that uh, hopefully mm. the government won't be taking down. Because I know that on the other side of that road, um, they have decided to plaster over the uh, the bullet holes that mm. uh, hold our history. So, so I mean, I know when we did our chat about this show, we said where we're, we're going to be some pretty horrific stories. Are there any stories we have missed, or you you wanted to go back and share from any period of this of this these awful months um, to just hammer home to people what the pe what the people of that city went through. Oh my God, we have so many, there's so many stories I could do. Uh, but I do I do want to touch on one, and it's one story that um, I've never really talked about. Uh, it came out a couple of years ago in the Polish newspapers, and it's, uh, it's a woman called Lutzina. And she fell in love with this insurgent. They never really talked about what they did. And he obviously went off to the Warsaw Uprising. He fought. And there were mixed messages getting back to her. He got She got a note from him. Um, and she said, I, I will wait for you. I will wait for you. And he wrote her a note. He was apparently in hospital. And we don't know. We don't know if he survived or he died. There's no evidence to tell us either way. But she waited for him for her whole life. Mm. Wow. She waited for him to come home. She never married. She never had children. Um, she was being faithful to him even if she knew if he wasn't going to come home. Um, that um, and there's a couple of, there's a couple of, others. so, um, uh, Maria Tsetis, I, I post about her quite a lot, actually, uh, when it comes down to the, to the memorials of the Warsaw Uprising, uh, codename Schimpans. She, for me, um, what she says just before she dies, for me, I, I leave as a motto. And 
she was one of the very few women that fought with a with a rifle um and and was a, was a shooter and she got injured in the hand she ended up in hospital she got it amputated at this point she's getting very very frustrated this is the beginning of september and she says look i'm going i'm leaving the hospital i'm going back to my unit she goes she gets stopped by a german german unit and they ask her are you a are you a bandit and she stands up and this is this is witnessed by by people she stands up proudly and she says i am a member of the home army so they shot her in the head mm, jesus yeah this is an everyday occurrence. I mean, to be honest, we should actually do, and we should uh, we should get Alexandra Ricci on board. We should do the massacre of Vola. If we want to hear the true, I mean, the pain and the horror of what the civilians went through. I mean, what we've talked about today has been horrific, but we should talk about the Vola massacre and the massacres, what happened and what the Rona brigade and what Der Levanger's brigade did and how they raped women and they tortured women. And I've heard some of the most horrific testimonies I've read where there was um, a group of them sitting by a table and uh, a witness saw a girl underneath the table. What she didn't realize is she was holding her stomach. Why she was holding her stomach, they'd gutted her mm. for fun. They were murdering, executing, looting, and even the SS brigades were horrified with what these men what these men were doing. They were the, yeah. the, the, the bottom of the bottom. Yeah, I mean, we, we touched on this with Douglas Nash and talked about the you know the irony is and when Alexandra as well is that the, the the units they sent into Warsaw were the shit ones. I mean, shit ones in both terms of that word. They were they were not the ones they wanted to put in the fighting against the Soviets on the other side of the river. So they were shit in the terms of their caliber as combat soldiers, but they were also shit in the sense that these were the absolute shitheads who murdering was fun and torturing was fun and killing was fun and were allowed to run havoc and do their own thing and club was almost no no authority, no control. And you know, you, you, you live in two worlds. You 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 live in a Polish speaking world in Poland and you also, you know, you're English and you travel around, you do things. Do you think we English speaking people know enough about what happened in Poland in World War Two. Do you want the brutal answer? Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Tell us. No. And that's underlined with about 10 lines. Um, I've done a couple of uh, talks with kids recently, and I was talking about the Warsaw, uh, the Warsaw, the occupation, and nobody knew anything I, I mean I do talks quite a lot now and people come back to me and say wow did that I, I didn't I didn't know that's how brutal occupation was I mean people being rounded up left right and center concentration camps were, were, the, were, were the place that you did not want to end up because you're not going to be getting out you, you know you're gonna you're gonna die mm. and Poland suffered so much and they suffered with with Poles uh, uh, even our Polish Jews you know, we lost six million citizens, three million Pol Pol uh, Poles and three million Polish Jews. And they were all our citizens. Six yeah. million people gone. Yeah. And we don't talk about it. We don't talk about it enough. Yeah. And and we just had the comment there, which I think is a valid one, is that, of course, later on, when the, 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 the Poles can be quite savage towards the Germans, they capture as well. I mean, these things can work to both ways you know when when things get shit shitness escalates on both sides doesn't it we we know i know that from normandy of the battles between the polish armor division and the ss in montormel is that the rules of engagement between those two forces were slightly different uh, to the rules of engagement between perhaps canadian forces and german forces you know 15 miles away so these things escalate everything gets bad anger and emotion run rife and then you know that the, the revenge comes into things and that's that's when it just gets so horrific so i mean we, we're going to have to bring things to an end eventually because you know otherwise we'll be talking miserable stuff but again there's people commenting here of how grateful they are to you alina for highlighting some of this stuff and reminding us that the world war ii is not it's it's a shit period of time and you know i've talked about it on other shows about how brexit brexit and things like that and modern britons use world war ii in some cases with this kind of positive imagery of churchill and our spirit and you know and we won rationing in world war ii sure and we had the blitz sure but 
World War II for Eastern Europe was just an absolute horror show from beginning to end, whether you're on either side of the campaign. It's just a horror show. The people what happened in Belarus and Latvia and Lithuania and Estonia and, and, and the Soviet Union itself, it's just an absolute shit show of horror. And it's about time we did more to examine that. And, and the niceties of the Normandy campaign in that sense, yes, there are the odd atrocities by the SS here, but there's a sense of sportingness in some cases between Germans and British and Americans. And every time I read about the Eastern Fund, it just reminds me how shit human beings can be and how when they get behind ridiculous fanatical causes, how sh even more shit they can be. And, you know, you've highlighted again just how awful this stuff has been. So I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you can manage to be an Auschwitz uh, historian and a Warsaw historian and, and still keep a smile on your face, Alina, because I think I'd be wanting to slash my wrists if I was reading what you're reading on day to basis, with day to day basis, just, just staggering. Yeah. Have we lost your audio? Are you still there? You know what? It's you have to hold a bit of a distance to it that there, there I have sort of a barrier um and someone's got to do it at the end of the day haven't they mm. and yeah. to be honest I enjoy commemorating people I enjoy telling their stories and giving them a giving it's so important to give people a voice these people have been silenced for so long and so for example um during the Soviet period in the um, the communist period, people weren't allowed to talk about it. You weren't allowed to celebrate your, your, you know, your accomplishments that you fought as a soldier. My, uh, my grandfather writes in a letter to his to his father. Uh, I find it so beautiful the way he writes this. He 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 wrote a letter just um, when he was in a displacement camp. And he writes that he writes, "Father, I um, I fought. I fought like a soldier. I fought for my country. I fought for the freedom. You know, you would be proud of me, of the soldier that I am. And these men and women and children, even children, I mean, so many children were involved in this uprising. It was just, it's, uh, it's incredible. These people survived and fought and lived. Mm. So there we go. Yeah, well, yeah, again, Alina, thank you very much for what you do. And people are thanking you on the comments there for what you're doing and your commitment and your passion and your 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 quest to get these stories and apologies told. Apologies for and, my internet being a bit funny. Yeah, well, it's um, it's Warsaw. I, I live in Poland, and, so yeah, we can blame the um, internet on Poland. Let's blame the internet. Blame, blame it on the Nazis. It's probably their fault. Um, so in terms of those watching, I'll put it on my screen for a second. I do need to remind you what we've got coming up. In fact, I'm going to play you a quick preview uh, because tomorrow we've got Prit Brutar coming on. So I'll just, I'll just, well, I'll put it up now. Here we go. So that's going to be tomorrow with Prit Brutar talking about the development. I'm looking forward to your eyes. That's got up in one. You've got one coming up, haven't you? Yeah, we've got more murders. Yeah, yeah, we've got more murders. Yeah, yeah. And that's, yeah, the, the Eisen Group one is coming up on the, the whatever date it is with uh, uh, a German historian, so um, German Swiss. So that's going to be interesting and look at another aspect of it. And he's published about that, another doctor, another incredible guy. So, yeah, we're, we, you know, we're, we're delving into these stuff. It's not just going to be World War II TV. I started in Normandy, my backyard, because that's where I lived and it was easy. But now we're spreading out further afield, literally and figuratively, to kind of discuss some of the other aspects of World War II. It doesn't get enough enough coverage uh, by english speaking um audiences so um what have you got coming on you've got your you've got your auschwitz podcast coming up you've got more work with history hack what's what's your big project you're working on right now my new book a lot of translation works going into it a lot um we'll see how it goes uh it's been it's been a bit of a struggle trying to balance work and podcasting and podcasting and more podcasting and and uh my wonderful other well alex more and my and wonderful podcasting partner my other wonderful podcasting partner milek who puts so much work into into what we do for our other one um it's yeah i'm sticking with the podcasting in the new book there's the bottom yeah. line a very long roundabout way, um, way of saying that sorry 
Yeah, no, but and, and again, folks, the links to Alina's uh, Auschwitz podcast are in the description below. And if you haven't had enough of horrific stories, I do think you should go and have a listen to that. I listen to them again, and I find myself having to sort of sit down for 10 minutes afterwards and just kind of compose my thoughts because, you know, we, we think we know about these things, but we don't know enough about them because we're, we, we, our brains sanitize. That's the, after we don't hear a story for a bit, our brains clean themselves up, I think. And we kind of put things, and then when you read another account again, you allow that horror into your head again. And then your brain, when you've stopped it, kind of removes it again. We're very good human beings, I think, at kind of protecting ourselves from that stuff, which is why someone said it, I think Martin Harley said it earlier on, you know, and no, no matter how many times you hear these these shitty tales, they still shock you, and rightly so. They should still shock us. The minute they don't shock us anymore, the minute we're not upset to, to other pits of our stomach by the stuff, then 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 something's gone wrong. They should still shock us. You should should still be traumatized when you read these accounts. You should still be bursting into tears, as I know you do when you read the most horrific accounts. If you don't have if that, doesn't happen to you anymore. It's time to move on and do something else. I think. So anyway, it's um, it's been. I wouldn't say it's been a pleasure talking to Alina because I've been, it's, it's it's emotionally very very um overwhelming. Brian Yee just said it himself. He says of all the shows he's watched, this is one of the most emotional of the ones he's done, and I think that's important. I think this will this will get picked up and people will share this and talk about what we're doing here. So. Thank you, Alina. You, 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 we love you here. You're welcome on any time to talk about your grandfather, your great uncle, any of your work here. Um, so, you know, internet permitting, we'll bring you back again. Um, so in terms of, uh, yeah, thanks for watching. Thanks for during, enduring this, this rather um, moving um, episode of World War II TV. We're back with Prit, with Buttar, Tamarit, and about the Red Army and lots more stuff coming up. We've got our REF week coming up at the end of the month. Um, as usual, don't forget to check out our Patreon page, check out Alina's links, check out us on Twitter and Facebook and all those things. You can check out our merchandise. Don't forget to check the book links in the bookstore. That helps us make a few pennies to keep these things going. If you're going to buy a book, you might as well buy it through our, 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 our book list and, and I can make a little bit of a commission on it. And Alexandra Ritchie's book on the Warsaw Uprising is probably one of the outstanding books written on the subject. So thank you very much, Alina. Thanks for watching. I'm going to end the stream now. Give, give everybody a wave, Alina, and go and take care of yourself. Thank you. And, uh, Good, the talk. Thank you. Yeah. See you then. Thanks, then. Bye, everybody. <laughs>